Good morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's House of Worship this morning. On this third Sunday after Pentecost, our focus is going to be on the call our Savior gives us to follow him. But it's not always that easy to follow him, and we will see that in our lessons today. It takes a lot. We have to sacrifice the world in order to gain that which God has promised us, and that's our eternal life in heaven. So although the cost is great to follow our Savior, the reward we will receive is even greater. So that'll be our focus today. We begin our service by singing hymn 711, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done. And we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue to sing, the Lord have mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us. 
Peace of forgiveness, we will join in singing Glory Be to God in the highest. Note that the congregation will join in the refrains, and then I will sing the stanzas. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared joys beyond understanding for those who love you. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated.
our first reading for this morning. We see recorded for us the call of Elisha to follow Elijah and what he did to give up and to never look back to what he used to have, but to look forward to the ministry to the Lord. Reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning at verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm for today is Psalm 62C. You will see it printed for you in your bulletin. And I will sing the first stanza and refrain, and the congregation can join in the following stanzas and refrains.
second reading for this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the believers in Corinth. Here Paul describes the grace that was shown to him that although all the struggles he goes through being an apostle of Christ, it's all worth it because Christ has given him that heavenly inheritance, that his weakness means nothing because we have God's strength to carry us. Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at the second half of verse 21. Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I am speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they, Is are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak, and I do not feel weak? Who is led to sin, and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of respect for the words and works of Jesus, please stand. And I will sing our gospel acclamation from Mark chapter 8. Verse 34. gospel reading for this morning also serves as the basis of our sermon. It comes from Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. Congregation may be seated. This time we will join in singing our hymn of the day, hymn 695, Take My Life and Let It Be.
God's word for our meditation comes from our gospel lesson for today. I will reread another verse for us. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. This is God's word. <clears throat> With every sports team that's out there, there are certain categories of fans, right? From the most casual to the most diehard fan you can think of. The most casual fan might sound something like this. He knows what town the sports team is in, but he's never been there before. He knows the colors of the team. He has an old t-shirt in his closet with the name of someone who hasn't played in 20 years on it, maybe. If he thinks about it, he might turn the game on, but during the commercial breaks, he just flips to other channels. If asked, he would say he's a fan, and if his team wins, great. If they lose, not a big deal. He doesn't care that much. Someone right in the middle of the, the fandom spectrum might sound something like this. She's been a fan since she was very young. Her parents grew her up with the team. For every article of clothing you can think of, she has one with the team's symbol on it, the logo. She tries to go to at least one or two games a year, but if she can't, it's fine. She'll just watch it on TV, and she's faithful with that. She reminisces about the time when the team used to be good when she was young, but now the team's struggling. She follows a few of the players on social media, and she knows some of the draft picks, but really she's focused on the starting lineup, the people that she knows. And the most extreme fan might sound something like this. He has season tickets on the 50-yard line, about three rows up. He knows every player on the entire roster and every stat that they've had for the past three or four years. He buys a new jersey every time they come out with one of the limited edition or special ones. He listens to two different sports podcasts to get all the updates on how his team is doing. He has a man cave in his basement dedicated to his team that would put everyone else's to shame. He has a few signed jerseys in, in frames hanging on the wall of said man cave. And for him, it's all about the team or it's nothing. He is as die-hard as you can get. He lives and he dies with that team. Which type of fan are you? Probably depends on the team, right? Whatever team you go for, whatever one you cheer for, and it probably depends on if you're even a fan of sports at all, if you care watching them. We probably all know of a family member or a friend that fits into every one of those categories but no matter what category they fall into or you fall into, you can consider all of them a fan of that team, no matter if they are casual or diehard. What type of fan are you of Jesus? Are you just a casual follower of him or are you the diehard follower of Jesus? And that's the question Jesus wants us all to wrestle with in our hearts today. What are we willing to sacrifice to be followers of him? Because in God's book, there's only one type of follower he wants, and that's the diehard. For God, it is all or nothing. Much like in the book of Acts, where Luke records the journeys of the apostles going around the Mediterranean and the world, so in, this, so in his gospel, we can see a main theme throughout that is Jesus' journey to Jerusalem to die. Many times in his gospel, we see verses similar to this one. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And this was his task from the very beginning, and Luke takes it step by step. Jesus did things in his ministry, but all throughout, it was to go to Jerusalem to die for our sins. But before he got to Jerusalem, he had to teach his disciples, those he was going to leave behind, 
what it really means to be a follower of him. Because some of them didn't quite understand it yet. They were looking for the glory of it. They frequently argued about who was going to be the best in the kingdom, what powers they were going to get from God. And Jesus tells them, we should not chase the glory of being a follower. We have to have the first commandment prioritized in our minds and in our hearts. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things, not look to put ourselves first. And we see an example of this sinful nature trying to take over when we see the sons of thunder here. When faced with rejection, the first inclination of James and John was this. Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? No. <laughs> Jesus rebuked that idea. Followers of Jesus should not resort to zealous punishment because someone opposes the gospel. If they reject the gospel after hearing it and don't want to listen to you, fine. The same goes for us today. When we have tried all we can to bring the gospel to someone, we take every barrier away so they have nothing in their way but to listen and they don't want to listen, fine. It's not our jobs as followers to force people to believe. We do what we can. We leave them in the very capable hands of our Savior, and we move on to the next one, much like Jesus did, moving on to the next town. Because if God were to strike down every single person who at one time or another opposed the gospel, we, none of us would be here. Because we are by nature dead enemies of God. We are not the ones to judge God is. That was lesson number one to his disciples. And now we see Jesus talk to three different men to correct their way of thinking about being a follower and to show us what it means to be a follower of Christ. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, Excuse me, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Come on, Jesus, I have to be homeless? To follow you? It's not a sin to have a home. I live in that house right back there. I have a nice bed to sleep in. I have food in my fridge. I have a nice TV with which to follow my sports teams. None of those things are inherently a sin, but where do I rank them in my heart? How much do you care about your home or the creature comforts that you have? Where is their place in your heart? How much do you care about those things that you have? Because if any of those things take of my time, my focus, and my energy away from God and carrying my cross, that's where the issue lies. Sorry, God, the game was on, or... Sorry, God, I have to vacuum from the hours of 9 to 11 on a Sunday morning doesn't cut it for him. And maybe it isn't your home, but what earthly comfort gets in your way from listening to your Savior, from carrying your cross and following him? And that's something Jesus wants you to wrestle with yourself. Jesus doesn't want casual followers who have one foot on this side of the line and one on the other saying, I'll follow you, but, or I'll follow you if Jesus wants you all in to pick up your cross and follow him. The next man approached Jesus and said to him, follow me. Or, and Jesus said to him, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Come on, Jesus, are funerals a sin? No, it is not a sin to mourn the death of someone who is near and dear to us. It's not a sin to be here in God's house to listen about the salvation that Jesus won for that person who has gone to heaven. If it were a sin, we would not have an order of service in our hymnal for a Christian funeral. Jesus here is describing someone who is spiritually dead, Burying someone who is physically dead. 
And Jesus gets to the heart of that man he was talking to and says to him, you cannot save the souls of the spiritually dead who have already physically died. Their soul is already in the hands of God or it is not. Your work to save souls is by proclaiming the message of the gospel to those who are still alive on this earth. So here Jesus prioritizes the work of the kingdom to those who can still hear and believe that message. The last man approached and said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, come on, Jesus, I can't even say goodbye. It's not a sin to say goodbye to your family. Elisha said goodbye to his when he left and followed Elijah. But notice what Elisha did, though. He burned all the bridges of his old life, quite physically and metaphorically, so to speak. There was nothing that he was holding on to from his previous life. He was not looking back. If you have a hand on the plow, or I guess now on the steering wheel, and you're looking back, your plow line is going to be crooked. And Jesus tells us, you must look ahead, stay on the straight path, keep the advancement of the kingdom at the forefront of your mind. These commands of Jesus are tough, right? Right? They cut into your heart. They make you think. Now these demands to follow him were aimed specifically at the men Jesus was talking to to get into their hearts, but with a little rearranging, we can apply them to us as well. What's stopping you from being that diehard follower of Jesus? From going all in for him? Is it what your family might think? About your social status within your group of friends? Is it the rejection of society that you fear? Is it the creature comforts of this world that we hold on so tightly to because we think they matter? Does the cross that Jesus asks you to carry look a little too burdensome and a little too heavy that you just don't want to do it? Every day, we need to look at ourselves and our own hearts and ask, what's stopping me from going all in? What's stopping me from picking up that cross and following my Savior? And once we acknowledge that and once we confess that to our God, we can look to our Savior for the confidence we need and for the example of what it means to always put the kingdom first. Because in our Savior, we see that the Son of Man forsook all earthly creature comforts to carry his cross resolutely to Jerusalem to die. Jesus did everything he needed to do, not always what he wanted to do, because the kingdom came first. Your soul came first in his mind. It's all or it's nothing. We cannot simultaneously... Uh, be a follower of Christ and be a follower of the world. We cannot serve two masters. It's all Jesus or it's nothing. But while we are asked to give up and to sacrifice everything to follow him, a promise has been given to those who do. And that promise is that at the end, when we receive our heavenly inheritance, we will be richly rewarded. In the end, we will receive above and beyond anything we think we want or need because our Heavenly Father knows what we need. We have been been promised this this heavenly inheritance from God because Jesus always put you and the kingdom first. Jesus gave up everything it was to be God and died for the kingdom so that we can pick up our cross confidently and follow him without a doubt because carrying that cross on this earth means carrying a crown of righteousness in heaven. For Jesus, it's all or it's nothing. 
Go all in for Jesus like he went all in for you. Amen. Please stand. Having heard the word of God, we will now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. congregation may be seated. This time we will join in the responsive prayer of the church and also in our prayers today we include a prayer for the family of Dolores Ash Howard and Emily A. Strike, relative of Don Sewall, both of whom are now with their Savior in heaven. And we also include a prayer for this country after receiving the news that Roe v. Wade has been repealed. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Extend your healing power to those who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Pour out your special blessing, especially on the family and friends of Dolores Ashower and Emily A. Strike. And Heavenly Father, comfort their families, whom you have now called to eternal glory in heaven. We praise you for making them your children in baptism and sustaining their faith through the good news about Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for the blessings you brought to your church, this community, and them through their family and their lives of Christian service. May the peace and promise of your Son's atoning sacrifice on the cross and his empty tomb Bring assurance to the hearts of all who mourn. Help us always to live in joyful anticipation of the day when you will call us from our graves, reunite us with them and all believers, and fill us with the perfect bliss of your presence forever. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. And hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence.
Heavenly Father, no matter what the future brings our nation after this appeal of Roe v. Wade, we know one truth remains. You lived and died for every soul and want all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of your truth. Guide and protect this country and its families moving forward and lead all of us to put our full trust in you. And gracious God, you govern and direct all things and you love all people. Hear our prayers spoken and silent and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We now continue by bringing forward our thank offering to the Lord and joining in singing hymn 736, Lord, you call us as your people. Please stand for prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. 
May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated. We join in our closing hymn in 737. Lord, help us walk your servant way. Once again, good morning to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Thanks also to all of our guests and visitors here and to those who are watching with us online today. A few quick announcements. One, we will continue our 19-minute Bible study series uh, immediately following Brief Fellowship. We will start that, and I promise it will be 19 minutes. So please come and join us for that. Uh, so, yeah, this past Monday, our sister in Christ, Dolores, entered eternal life. Her funeral will be on July 16th. So Saturday, July 16th, there will be a visitation from 9 to 11 with the funeral service at 11. So if you are able, please come and, and join in celebrating what our Savior lived and died for Dolores. A few other quick announcements. You see important dates to note. Uh, so Freedens and Bonwell received a graduate, a great blessing from God. So if you are interested in going to that installation service to support him as he is starting out, like I was so supported last year, uh, please contact me and so I can let them know how many of us might go and be there so the ladies can get food ready for that celebration. 
Other than that, we have a quarterly council meeting coming up Wednesday, July 13th at 5.30. So all members of the council, we really sincerely need you to be there. We also have three birthdays that we will be celebrating. So Judy Bryant, my niece Addie Peterson, and Oral Severson. So let's sing happy birthday to all. quick announcement. So this is from Dave Schley. Attention ushers. Errors have been found in our current ushering schedule for the upcoming months. Please replace the old schedule with the updated one in your mailbox. So if you are an usher, please look for that new updated list. Any other announcements? Chuck. Um, just a reminder that this Tuesday at um, 630, there's going to be kind of a get together here at church. We're going to watch a presentation from the Lutheran Leadership Conference. It's a really good opportunity to come and just learn from a church that has a really great culture of outreach with not the casual fans of Jesus, but ones going out into their community. So we're gonna watch this presentation and then discuss it and also just apply it here and what we can do. So please come this Tuesday at 6.30. Any other announcements from anybody else? All right, let us pay attention to the TVs for this month's Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Education makes a difference, not just in academic achievement, but also in developing Christian character. A powerful illustration of how education can transform lives is on display at Kingdom Prep, a new Wells Area Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. When we got started, it's hard as a new school coming into a space and just saying, okay, make us number one on your list, right? It started off with eighth grade young men coming to build a high school. And so these eighth grade young men came to Wednesday night founders groups and they started designing one at a time uh, the mascot, the school day, what we would wear, uh, where we would go on Exploration Thursday trips. How do we create a space to be able to continue to serve kids from the city? How do we make uh, young men who are ready to be men of the kingdom? Anybody else got something that they want to say from what Mr. Spurrier was talking about? when he was last up here. Cam, what you got for me, loud and proud? We now have about 200 young men, and you now have these originally eighth graders. They're now the seniors who've gotten much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more biblically centered, and they are now raising up the next generation of freshmen who will come in here next and carry on the legacy. Oh, it's all boys school. I was already struggling in middle school because you know there's females distracting me. All right, I'm going to an all guys area. Think of it as a football team and everything runs smoothly. And so when we first uh, came up with the idea of an all-boys school, we like brotherhood. We want to be brothers. We want, we want to be a family. Even with our lunch, we have a family-style lunch where everybody comes to sit down at the table. We have a table captain. You want to work with your family through the hard times, the good times, you know, the bad times. You always with your family. The next line, lazy hands make for what? Uh, True. Apostle Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in so by doing, you fulfill the law of Christ, which is obviously to love one another. The way that we built brotherhood through Christ and God is like really important because he's like the main building block. He's what we all base ourselves around, and like being able to talk to other guys about that is one of the best parts about the school. I have a group of people that I can talk to about religion or if I'm struggling, they're always there to talk to me. They'll bring up Bible verses or anything like that. We're on game all the time. 
and you keep on missing Bible study because you're mm -hmm. on your phone or your game. So whatever hurts my brother hurts me. So if my brother needs help with something, I'm gonna be there to help him out. We're only as strong as our weakest link, right? Uh, we're here to constantly be being able to bend over and pick a brother up, fixing whatever traumas and things that they've experienced within themselves. Counseling is a big piece around here, and how do we allow them to be able to express themselves? We live in a city where like, there's a lot of bad influences and you're not really able to be yourself. You're not able to be vulnerable. I preach the gospel to them, right? But I'll give them some practical wisdom in here and say, young man. I was pretty down on the situation I was in and coming here, it grew my faith with God because as I was in a low place in life, um, I went to God. Your personal mission statement should be timeless. And then the realization of, I need my Lord to get me through these tough times and it helped a lot build my um, faith. Number two, you can find truth for your life by reading God's word. Cause you know, everybody has stuff going on at home or things in general and like being able to go to a place where you can feel comfortable and like be vulnerable, talk to people without being judged. We're preparing young men for leadership, uh, for trade school, for college, for entrepreneurship, you name it. I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MOC is a school for teachers. It'll help me keep my faith while I'm still up there, and two, I can still play football. All the things that I've learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons teachers have taught me, all the good values and principles, I'm bringing out all with me as well. They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think they're going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church, you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in, but how are you intrinsically a better young man? But to be able to do a, a work from my heart and to continue to live towards his glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your value. I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ. And so that's where the kingdom part comes in. You know, we are doing it to serve Christ. So that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old which means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates, heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year, a tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day. God bless your week.